focus of this module is to progress your statistical knowledge beyond descriptive statistics. We want to start to be able to reach conclusions that go beyond describing what the data is or what the data shows. This module deals with inferential statistics. Inferential statistics are used to try and apply the findings of outsample data to the wider population. Inferential statistics are also used to infer conclusions about the probability that an observed difference between groups is dependable um, on another or a difference might have happened by chance. As with descriptive statistics, the type of data analysis that we can use is determined by the data type or level of measurement of your data. Inferential statistics, they are divided into uh, parametric and non-parametric and these will be the focus of this module. Firstly, we need to deal with hypotheses. Inferring conclusions from your data or um, making generalizations to the wider population involve testing hypotheses. For some uh, quantitative research, developing research questions lead on to developing hypotheses. Hypotheses are statements or proposals about relationships between variables or differences between groups that can be tested. For example, um, is a person's economic group associated with their occupation of work? Hypothesis testing is an important strategy in social research. However, of course, not all quantitative research involves testing hypotheses. For example, um, the project may be about uh, quantifying a particular population rather than testing different variables within it. The main advantage to hypothesis testing is, of course, that it is easier to make generalizations from your data to the wider population with hypothesis testing than it is through exploratory analysis methods. Hypothesis testing requires us to set up two uh, opposing possibilities, a null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis. The null hypothesis is a formal statement that no relationship is predicted between the independent and the dependent variables we are testing. For instance, um, in the example from the last slide, the null hypothesis would be that a person's occupation is not dependent on their socio-economic group. The alternative hypothesis or prediction is that there is a difference and a person's occupation is dependent on their socio-economic status and this finding can be generalised to the wider population. The issue behind the null hypothesis is that it means we have to start by assuming a particular pattern to the population. We then have to test this to see if there is enough evidence from our sample data to reject the null hypothesis and then accept the alternative. Once we have obtained our results, we then want to know how confident we can be that what we have observed in the sample will be observed in the population. We usually work off a 5% level or a 0.05 level of significance and this corresponds to 95% confidence. If our results are significant at 0.5, um, at the 0.5 level, we are 95% confident that what we observe will occur in the population. This means that there is only a 5% chance of observing what you have observed assuming the null hypothesis was true. Phrased another way, there is only a 5% chance that your observation is due to random variation. It is of course possible to wrongly interpret the results of the hypothesis testing and see things that are just not there. There are two possible errors that can be made during hypothesis testing and these are what we call type 1 and type 2 errors. A type 1 error is saying that there is a significant association um, relationship or difference when there is not and a type 2 error is saying that there is no statistical difference when there is. Setting the statistical significance level will affect the likelihood of committing um, a type 1 or a type 2 error. Changing your measurement tool, um, errors they exist with all measurement tools but potentially a more accurate tool may help reduce the likelihood of error. Once you have developed your hypothesis or hypotheses and selected the variables to test, the next thing to do is to apply the correct test. Inferential statistics can be divided into three main groups. Those that try to find out if the differences observed between two data sets or two sets of scores are significant in the statistical sense. Those that examine two sets of scores to find the strength of any association between them 
and those that compare more than two sets of scores to find, out, to find the extent to which they vary together. And we are going to talk about each one of those um, in turn throughout this lecture series. The test that you choose is dependent on the data type or the level of measurement of your data, i.e. whether it is nominal ordinal or scale, and of course scale is both interval and ratio. Tests are classified um, as parametric, which deals with um, scale data that is normally distributed, and non-parametric, which deals with nominal, uh, nominal or ordinal um, data and or it breaks the assumptions of a normal distribution. Parametric tests can be applied to interval and ratio data or what we call scale data that is normally distributed. However, a fuller set of rules apply to the distribution of data in order to be able to use parametric statistical tests. Those are that the sample must be representative of the target population so that the variables being measured fall within the normal distribution uh, for that population, i.e. that means that random selection must have occurred. The variables must have been measured in a manner that generates interval or ratio data. And the subjects in the two groups that are being examined need to be either randomly assigned to each group or each group must be matched according to the respondent's age, gender, so on and so forth. For non-parametric tests, because non-parametric data makes no assumptions about the distribution of the data, we cannot perform analysis based on means or standard deviations. So non-parametric statistics cannot provide you definitive measures of actual difference between population samples. A non-parametric test may tell you that two interventions um, are different, but it cannot provide a confidence interval for the difference of even a simple mean difference between the two. In understanding what tests to run, a key element is understanding how the variables you are testing are distributed. In the last two slides, we have said that for parametric tests, the variables tested must fall within a normal distribution, and that data that are normal or ordinal, or the population characteristics do not meet a normal distribution, or the sample is too small, these require the use of non-parametric tests. Non-parametric tests are based on other types of distributions and have different shaped curves. So we need to understand to start with that a normal distribution is um, and its relationship, what a normal distribution actually is and what its relationship is with the central limit theorem. In mathematical probability theory, the central limit theorem states that when repeated successive random samples are taken from a population, the distribution of the sample means calculated for each sample be approximately normally distributed. Now the central limit theorem has um, a number of important assumptions. The first is that when there is a normal distribution of a variable in a population, the sampling distribution of the mean ends up being normal. It also states that when the population distribution is not normal, central limit, th central limit theorem states that um, as the sample size increases, then the sampling distribution of the mean becomes normal. So as, you, as your sample gets bigger, um, the, your distribution moves towards a norm becoming a normal distribution. Um, it also assumes that taking repeated or large samples and calculating the mean um, of the sample means will equal the population mean. So again, we're looking at a similar premise. When the standard error, okay, so standard error um, is what we actually call standard deviation of the sample means, okay, so the standard error of a sampling distribution is unknown um, when we can see the standard deviation of a sample as an estimate. A further feature of the central limit theorem is that the mean is calculated from all of the sample means. Its value will be approximately equal to the population mean. If we calculate the mean of sample means, then we can also, of course, calculate a standard deviation. Standard deviation um, is, in plain English, how far on average each value is from the mean, and you can see the formula there. The standard deviation of all sample means is what we call the standard error, and you 
you can see there, SE equals the standard deviation of the population divided by um, the square root of your n number of cases. Um, the smaller the value of the standard error of the mean, the better the sample mean is an estimate of the population mean. But having said that, in practice we are very, very, very unlikely to know the standard deviation um, of our population. Um, obviously we'll know it of our own sample, but the estimate, but the uh, population at large, we're very, very unlikely to know what the standard deviation of that actually is. Um, but as the distribution of the sample means approximates a normal distribution, we can use these principles um, of a normal distribution curve to calculate the likely range that the population mean is going to fall in, um, estimated on our own sample mean. Um, and to do this, this actually means that we have to calculate confidence intervals. So given both the sample and the true population, given that they both follow a normal distribution, we can assume that the mean of the sample um, is an indicator of the mean of the population. But how confident can we be that this is actually the case? What if our sample mean is 70, but the mean of the true population is actually 71? To decide how confident we are that the findings in our sample can be generalised to the population um, at large, we need to calculate confidence intervals. The level of confidence is a measure of how statistically confident we are that the calculated measurement is correct. It's normally expressed as a percentage, often 95%. The principles of a normal distribution curve states that 95% of the area under the curve, or cases within our sample population, will fall between minus 1.96 and plus 1.96 standard deviations. Knowing our sample mean, we can then look to calculate the range within which we would expect the population mean to fall from our sample mean with a level of confidence of 95%. At a 95% confidence level, we would expect our confidence, interval, our confidence interval results to be correct 19 times out of 20. The level of significance is 100% minus the level of confidence, so for example 5%. This can also be expressed as um, a p-value, so for p um, less than 0.05%, that's less than 5%, and p greater than 0.05%, which is more than 5%. The confidence uh, intervals are a measure of the upper and the lower range of values in which we would expect a known population parameter to occur within a stated level of significance. As you can see here, this is just an example of um, what a confidence interval equation looks like. And you can see x bar is um, your sample mean. Okay, and you have the plus or minus 1.96, um, and that's multiplied by your standard deviation over the square root of your count. And that can be further squashed and summarized to uh, the calculation below which is your x bar um, and it's multiplied by your standard error. As if we go back to the other equation we know that um, your standard deviation of the population divided by um, the square root of your count ends up being standard error. So let's go through a worked example okay, to make it a little bit clearer to understand. Um, the average price of oranges from a sample of 150 orange prices with a mean price of 32.5 pence and a standard deviation of 5.5 pence. The standard error for this is going to equal 0.449 pence and the sample mean um, as a best estimate of the true population it can calculate confidence intervals at 95%. So if we start off and um, we use the equation that we know, we take the mean price of 32.5 pence, um, we plus 1.96 and we multiply that by our standard error of 0.449 and that equals uh, 32.5 plus 0.88 at the 95% confidence um, level. And this basically gives us um, a 
range of 31.62 and 33.38 in our pence. So in English that basically means that we can be 95% confident that the population average price of oranges will lie between 31.62 pence and 33.38 pence. We've talked a lot about um, normal distributions and it's important at this stage to go over what we mean by a normal distribution. Um, and you can see here um, on the graphic is an example of what we mean by a normal distribution or sort of a bell-shaped curve. Um, the shape of normal distribution is determined by both the mean and the standard deviation. Um, many scale variables um, approximate to a normal distribution curve and when we're looking at that we're actually looking at calculating the areas under a curve. Um, so if we look at an example, um, the mean age of 55 years and a standard deviation of 6 years, we can estimate that 95.4% of cases will fall between plus and minus 2 standard deviations from the mean or between 43 years and 67 years.